video, we're going to cover the drugs that affect arachidonic acid metabolism, specifically drugs used to inhibit cyclooxygenases. We're going to break down non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NZs. But before we start the lecture, be a sweet neuron and subscribe to the channel. Once you've done that, let's do a quick recap of arachidonic acid metabolism. So this process starts with arachidonic acid, which is stored in the cell membrane as part of phospholipids. Arachidonic acid is an unsaturated fatty acid, and it's a precursor to produce eicosanoids, which are lipid mediators that help regulate things close to where they are made. It's released when the enzyme phospholipase A2 cleaves it from the membrane. Once released, arachidonic acid can follow several metabolic pathways depending on the type of cell and the specific enzymes present. It also depends on the stimulus that triggered the release of the arachidonic acid. So these pathways include cyclooxygenase pathway, which produces prostaglandins and thromboxanes, lipoxygenase pathway, which produces leukotrienes, and other enzymatic pathways, which create additional metabolites, which we won't go through in this lecture. Now, we're going to focus on the cyclooxygenase pathway, specifically the synthesis of prostaglandins. So the enzyme that produces prostaglandins is known as cyclooxygenase, or COX. There are two main types of this enzyme that we'll focus on, COX-1 and COX-2. So these are isoforms of the same enzymes. They are highly homologous, meaning they have lots of structural and sequence similarities, but they are different in where they are expressed and the tissue they are located in, and also when those enzymes are expressed. So there's COX-1, which is the constitutive enzyme. So this is the housekeeper enzyme. It handles roles like protecting the stomach lining and supporting blood flow. And then there's COX-2, which is the inducible enzyme that is upregulated during inflammation. So it produces prostaglandins involved in swelling and pain. In the previous lecture, we covered what happens in acute inflammation, so you can go check that out. Now, the medications that target these enzymes are called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There are two main types of NZs. We have non-selective NZs, so these drugs block both COX-1 and COX-2, meaning they reduce prostaglandins involved in inflammation, but also those that protect the stomach and regulate blood flow. So this dual action is effective, but it can cause side effects like stomach irritation. Okay, And the other class of NZs are the selective drugs. These drugs specifically target COX-2, focusing on reducing inflammation and pain. The key effect of both types of NZs is the same, reducing prostaglandin production by blocking cyclooxygenase. Okay? Since prostaglandins are critical in inflammation and pain, these drugs are commonly used to manage those symptoms. So now let's subtract complexity and break down how NZs work and their effects on the body. Okay, so we said they block the production of prostaglandins, which are chemicals involved in various processes including inflammation, pain, and fever. How does this work? So number one, in reducing inflammation. So prostaglandins causes vasodilation, so widening of blood vessels, which increases blood flow to injured areas, which leads to redness and warmth. They also increase capillary permeability, leading to swelling. So by, inhi by inhibiting prostaglandins, NZs help reduce redness, warmth, and swelling during acute inflammation. Number two, pain relief. So prostaglandins enhance the body's sensitivity to pain by interacting with pain mediators. So NZs block this process, reducing pain caused by inflammation. And number three, lowering fever. Prostaglandins also play a role in raising body temperature during fever. Now, while NSAIDs are effective for treating inflammation and pain, prostaglandins also have important roles in normal body functions, which can lead to side effects. So we said stomach protection, so prostaglandins help protect the stomach lining by reducing acid secretion and increasing mucus production. So blocking them can lead to stomach irritation or ulcers. And they also maintain blood flow to the kidneys, so NSAIDs may reduce this, potentially causing kidney issues, especially in people with pre-existing conditions, okay? And then they also help regulate platelet aggregation, so NSAIDs can affect blood clotting and increase the risk of bleeding. And prostaglandins also help in processes like uterine contractions, so 
and Zs may interfere with these actions. Okay? Now, NSAIDs are very commonly used and can be found both as prescription medications and over-the-counter remedies, right? So most people likely have an NSAID like ibuprofen or aspirin in their home. Now, there are lots of different individual NSAIDs and they are quite diverse in terms of their chemistry, but what they have in common is their similar therapeutic effects because of their mechanism of action. So let's go through some of our specific non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, starting with Aspirin. Aspirin is one of the oldest and well-known NZs, right? It's a non-selective cyclooxygenase inhibitor, meaning it blocks both COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. So aspirin is widely used for pain relief, so treating mild to moderate pain, fever reduction, inflammation control, as well as prevention of blood clots. So at low doses, aspirin is often used as a prophylactic drug due to its antiplatelet effects, helping to prevent heart attacks and strokes. Now, it's important to note that when patients are being treated with aspirin to inhibit platelet activation, the doses that are used are much lower than those used for its anti-inflammatory or pain-relieving effects. And we'll go through that later. Now, when it comes to side effects, aspirin can cause side effects, right? Many of which are similar to those seen with other NZs. So the first one is GI effects. So aspirin inhibits prostaglandins that protect the stomach lining. So this increases the risk of gastritis, stomach ulcers, and other GI issues due to reduced mucus production and increased acid secretion. We'll go through that later. And bleeding, because by blocking prostaglandins involved in platelet aggregation, aspirin increases the risk of bleeding, particularly at higher doses. So let's move on and talk about how aspirin affects platelet activation and aggregation. Let's break this down. It targets the synthesis of two key eicosanoid mediators derived from arachidonic acid. So arachidonic acid is the precursor that is metabolized by cyclooxygenase to produce endoperoxides, which then produce two different eicosanoid mediators that are both involved in regulating platelet activation. So we have thromboxane A2, which promotes the activation and aggregation of platelets. This molecule is produced primarily in platelets, so your platelets are your main source of thromboxane. And then the second molecule is the prostacyclin molecule. So this is a molecule that inhibits platelet activation and aggregation, and it's produced in endothelial cells. So an important thing to note about aspirin is that it's an irreversible inhibitor of cyclooxygenase. How does it do this? Let's go through it. Aspirin irreversibly inhibits the enzyme because it acetylates the active site of COX. So it acetylates the site where the substrate binds to the enzyme. That acetylation is a covalent modification of the protein, which means once that aspirin has bound to the active site and acetylated it, even once the aspirin is removed, that cyclooxygenase is permanently inactivated in the affected cell. So it permanently in so it's permanently inhibited for as long as that protein is around in cells, okay? So the thromboxane that is produced downstream of cyclooxygenase is predominantly produced in platelets, okay? So your platelets, again, are your main source of thromboxane. So the way aspirin exerts its antiplatelet effects is by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase in platelets that prevents the synthesis of thromboxane A2. So by inhibiting COX in platelets, what happens? Aspirin prevents the production of thromboxane a2. Because if you don't produce the intermediates that are the products of COX, you obviously can't produce the end product of thromboxane, right? So now this irreversible inhibition of cyclooxygenase is really important for distinguishing the different effects of aspirin. So it has important consequences for how long aspirin exerts an antiplatelet effect and also impacts upon the dose required to produce an antiplatelet effect. Okay, so earlier we talked about how the dose of aspirin used for antiplatelet effects is much lower than the dose of aspirin that is used for anti-inflammatory and analgesic effects, right? So low dose aspirin is commonly used as a preventative treatment for patients at high risk of cardiovascular disease and myocardial infarction. Okay, and it's also prescribed to individuals who have previously experienced a heart attack, maintaining them on chronic low-dose aspirin 
therapy. Typically, a daily dose of aspirin helps reduce platelet activation, thereby lowering the risk of cardiovascular disease. So aspirin works by irreversibly inhibiting cyclooxygenase. Okay, so the cyclooxygenase, responsible for producing the precursors of thromboxane A2, again, is mainly found in platelets, which are the cells that produce thromboxane A2. So to recap, COX-1 produces intermediates that are then converted by thromboxane synthase into thromboxane A2, and this molecule plays a key role in activating and aggregating platelets, like we've mentioned, and by inhibiting COX-1 in platelets, aspirin reduces the pr production of thromboxane A2. Now, it's important to know that platelets are not typical cells. They are fragments of larger cells called megakaryocytes, and they lack a nucleus. So because of this, platelets can't produce new proteins, including cyclooxygenase. So when aspirin, so when aspirin irreversibly inhibits COX-1 in platelets, the inhibition lasts for the entire lifespan of the platelet, which is about 7 to 10 days. Since aspirin is an irreversible inhibitor, the COX-1 inhibition persists for the full life of the platelet. So here's the thing though. Another product of COX-1 is prostacyclin, okay, which is produced in endothelial cells, which are complete cells with nuclei, and they have the ability to regenerate cyclooxygenase. So while aspirin reduces COX-1 activity in endothelial cells initially, those cells can eventually produce new cyclooxygenase, allowing them to continue generating prostacyclin, right, which reduces platelet activation. So then it's a bit confusing, right? Let's take a step back because if cyclooxygenase produces both thromboxane that stimulates platelet activation and prostacyclin that inhibits platelet activation, how is it that inhibiting cyclooxygenase has this antiplatelet effect? And the reason is because of where the cyclooxygenase is located and where the thromboxane and prostacyclin are being produced. So when aspirin is administered, it will be inhibiting cyclooxygenase in both the platelets and also in the endothelial cells. The difference is that the endothelial cells are normal, fully functioning cells. So they have a nucleus and they're capable of synthesizing new cyclooxygenase. However, in the platelets, they can't generate new cyclooxygenase. So what that means is that over time, with a low dose of aspirin, you will eventually get almost complete inhibition of cyclooxygenase in the platelets. So you can't be producing thromboxane, right? So we're shifting the balance towards inhibiting platelet aggregation and preventing clot formation. And the effectiveness of low-dose aspirin as an antiplatelet therapy is due to its ability to irreversibly inhibit COX-1 in platelets, which can't regenerate the enzyme. This is why even low doses of aspirin can provide significant antiplatelet effects, while higher doses that affect inflammatory pathways are not required for this purpose, because inflammation, which involves prostaglandin production occurs in cells that can resynthesize new COX-1, explaining why aspirin's antiplatelet effect is separate from its anti-inflammatory or analgesics effect, right? So the antiplatelet effect of aspirin at low doses is critically dependent on the irreversible inhibition of cyclooxygenase in platelets, along with the inability of platelets to resynthesize new cyclooxygenase enzyme. It's a beautiful process, right? So moving on to side effects, as we've discussed, one of the most common side effects of drugs like aspirin is damage to the gastrointestinal tract. And this occurs, take a look at this, because the proton pump, which is responsible for acid secretion in the GI tract, is regulated by prostaglandins produced in the gastric mucosa as a result of cyclooxygenase activity. So the proton pump is activated by mediators such as histamine and acetylcholine, while prostaglandins help reduce its activity. So by decreasing proton pump activity, prostaglandins lower acid secretion. So these prostaglandins promote the production of mucus, right, that lines the GI tract, which helps protect the stomach lining from the harmful effects of stomach acid. But when drugs like aspirin are taken, they inhibit not only cyclooxygenase in platelets and inflammatory cells, but also the production of these protective prostaglandins. So what happens then? What happens? Well, there's a reduction in protective prostaglandins, which contributes to GI tract 
damage, our stomach irritation. So that's non-selective NZs. Let's now move on to the second class, which are the selective cyclooxygenase inhibitors. So as we discussed earlier, there are two types of cyclooxygenase enzymes. We have COX-1 and COX-2. So COX-2 is usually present in lower amounts under normal conditions, but its level increase during inflammation. Now, the increase in COX-2 expression is thought to contribute significantly to the production of pro-inflammatory mediators. So for a long time, NZs like aspirin and ibuprofen were commonly used to treat chronic inflammatory diseases such as arthritis because these drugs help reduce inflammation and provide relief. But of course, there were limitations to using these NZs, especially because they could cause GI issues like chronic gastritis and an increase an increased risk of peptic ulcers. So patients with chronic inflammatory diseases such as arthritis often needed to take high doses of NZs over long periods, which led to severe gastrointestinal side effects for many of these patients. So this is where the development of selective COX-2 inhibitors came in. So the idea behind these drugs was that COX-2 is primarily responsible for the anti-inflammatory effects, while COX-1 is the enzyme that regulates functions like renal blood flow and the production of gastroprotective prostaglandins. So the goal was to create a drug that selectively inhibited COX-2. This way, it could reduce inflammation with fewer gastrointestinal side effects compared to non-selective NZs like aspirin and ibuprofen. Now, we won't go through the history here, but among the selective COX-2 inhibitors still available, celecoxib is the main example. Now, when it comes to the clinical use of NZs, many of the non-selective inhibitors are quite similar in terms of effectiveness. There are various NZs on the market, but the choice of which NZ to prescribe depends on several factors, including the drug's duration of action, potential toxicity, patient tolerance, likelihood of side effects, and possible interactions with other medication. So some patients may respond better to one NZ over another, so doctors may switch between different NZs to find the one that works best for the patient. So in general, there is little therapeutic benefit to using more than one NZ at the same time for pain relief because adding another NZ usually doesn't provide additional pain relief but does increase the risk of side effects. Okay, so the key non-selective COX inhibitors to be familiar with are aspirin and ibuprofen, while the main selective COX-2 inhibitor to know is celecoxib. Okay, before we end this lecture, let's summarize everything we've covered. So to summarize the synthesis of prostaglandins and other eicosanoids, COX is a key enzyme in both pathways. So COX-1 is the constitutive enzyme, meaning it's always present, while COX-2 is inducible and mainly involved in inflammation. So both enzymes play a role in the metabolism of arachidonic acid, which is released from the cell membrane by phospholipase A2. So once released, arachidonic acid undergoes various enzymatic reactions with COX-1 and COX-2 being crucial for this process. These enzymes convert arachidonic acid into endoperoxides, which are, further, which are then further metabolized into thromboxanes and prostaglandins. So the COX-1 pathway is important for producing thromboxane A2, which triggers platelet aggregation and prostacyclin, which inhibits platelet aggregation. It also produces the prostaglandins that protect the GI tract. Okay, and then on the other hand, the COX-2 pathway mainly produces pro-inflammatory prostaglandins and then non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin and ibuprofen, which are non-selective inhibitors, block both COX-1 and COX-2, affecting both pathways. On the other hand, selective COX inhibitors like celecoxib primarily target the COX-2 pathway, which is more involved in inflammation.